So where we left off um, in our previous lecture, we were talking about the determining the member uh, bending capacity for a steel section. So uh, before that, we'd looked at, you know, how do we determine the uh, the moment which can be carried by a given section. Um, and so once we have that section, that's sort of the maximum bending capacity we could get out of that. So either we'll develop that um, section completely or um, the member will be subjected to uh, some global buckling of the over a segment length. And because this is a buckling problem, uh, we looked at, well, there's a, a number of things which it is um, based upon where uh, section geometry, boundary conditions, etc. Um, and then we went through and uh, because the top of, uh, so was, well, whatever flange is in compression is going to be the one that wants to buckle while um, if we have a bending problem, uh, the uh, flange which is in tension uh, will stay stable. So that's going to induce some torsion um, into the problem as well because that top will want to sort of uh, kick out and, and twist. And so we went through, we did a, a quick derivation, um, seeing that, you know, the lateral, the moment, uh, oh, the applied moment, which would uh, create this lateral torsional buckling is going to be some combination of uniform torsion, warping torsion, out of plane bending. Uh, we went through and we uh, did some derivations for uh, the relationship between, uh, basically was what we're looking at is, you know, uh, where we start moving out of plane. So anytime where this, uh, you know, d um, phi is, is greater than zero, uh, well, we've started to buckle. And so, you know, that could occur from some applied torque. Um, and, you know, from that applied torque, uh, we showed that uh, open sections uh, are, are far, will have a lot more uh, likelihood to twist uh, than closed sections. Um, we also saw that there will be some warping torsion uh, if the element uh, is restrained at one end, uh, and that was our relationship for warping torsion. Um, and that you know there will be some uh, some buckling moment at which will occur, which is this um, MOB. Um, so in this looks will be very. And then we we pulled all of that together for this derived case of uh, just a uniform moment being applied over the um, at both ends of a simply supported beam. So that gives us a nice constant bending moment diagram along the length. Um, it's a uh, mathematically nicer case to, to derive um, as well as it's kind of an upper bound for the uh, the most amount of bending moment demand uh, distribution we could get uh, along the case uh, along the beam. So we pulled all of that together and we got um, a uh, relationship for the um, the moment which uh, so which at which point uh, lateral torsional buckling would occur for a given section. Um, and we can see that uh, you know while this is a sort of large complicated equation, uh, that there's really it, it breaks down into um, these parts of, you know, a buckling portion. So this is a very similar equation to Euler buckling. And that's going to be linked to our out-of-plane bending. And that makes sense because that's, um, if my if my fingers here are the, uh, so these are the top flange of a beam being bent, you know, this way. Uh, well, they're going to want to kick out uh, at, um, if we have lateral torsional buckling occurring. Um, this G times J portion is the uniform torsion uh, portion. So that's the twisting aspect. And then we have this portion over here, which is our warping torsion. Um, and so that was our, our overall uh, derivation uh, for, for this critical moment at which buckling would occur. Um, but then we wanted to go through and see, well, how does the steel standard NZS3404 treat this? And um, uh, first, so the, the, the big difference here um, other than just calling it um, a reference buckling moment MO versus uh, a critical buckling moment MCR, it's a pretty trivial difference there, is that we go from these L's to these LE's. So for the derived case, uh, we just took L as the entire length of the member, while LE uh, will help us, well, will allow us to uh, take into account and, and change this into an effective length based upon uh, what our boundary conditions are for a, for a given segment, 
um, what the height of the load is applied um, and, and sort of what our restraints are. Um, and so uh, one of the first things that uh, we do with um, an NSS 3404 uh, is that um, because we derive this case, uh, actually a rather um, uh, sort of intense case uh, in terms of loading of just these uh, two applied moments at the end. And so that gave us a uniform uh, moment distribution. But when we have a, a, you know, a building or a beam which is uh, being used in practice, we often don't have um, a, a uniform distribution. We have some other distribution. So um, NZS 3404 uses this alpha M factor here uh, as our means to essentially scale up um, our allowable reference moment. So if this, uh, you know, two moments uniform distribution is our worst case, uh, any other distribution means that we've got greater capacity um, because it's not loaded as heavily. And so that's what these um, alpha M factors are. And you can see how they change um, sort of based upon the, uh, the load distribution. Um, there's a full list of them uh, in table 5.6.1. I believe this is for uh, having both ends of the segment being supported. Um, and 5.6.2 is where one end is supported and the other end is uh, free to move, uh, sort of like a cantilever. Um, all of them, uh, so while they're tabulated for some um, you know, classic cases, if you have a arbitrary uh, bending moment profile, um, this is this equation here, which you can use to uh, derive your alpha M for any unique cases. Um, so that's our, our alpha M. That was the first way that the, uh, we looked at that in which the code um, uh, changes uh, this critical buckling moment. Uh, the other one was about where we applied the load. And it was in relation to its height above the shear center. So um, I've down on this uh, drawing, so say that we, we have some a simply supported beam, um, and it's just starting to uh, yeah, buckle outward, just starting to undergo lateral torsional buckling. Um, so we have two, you know, two cases here. Case one, where so I've drawn the applied load as a uh, as a solid line. Uh, so say we're applying it right at the shear center of the member, uh, because this is a doubly symmetric I section. The shear center is at the centroid. Um, well, the internal reaction will always occur there. Um, and then so what we care about is, well, what's our difference between uh, where our applied load is? And then the applied load I just have as this um, uh, solid arrow over here. So if they, um, if we apply it um, at or say, uh, you know, maybe if we apply it below uh, the shear center, well, that's going, and if we sum our moments about here, uh, well, that's a stabilizing moment. So if we're already twisting um, this direction, well, by applying it uh, at the center, it's either not uh, occur, not giving us any additional spin, or if we apply it at the uh, bottom flange, it wants to pull it back. Uh, conversely, uh, if we have um, the uh, load applied to the top flange. Well, again, you know, from mechanics, the shear center, uh, the internal reaction is always going to occur through that line. Um, so if we apply uh, the load from the top flange and it starts to uh, rotate out because it's twisting, because it's undergoing lateral torsional buckling, well, now we have, so the section's already twisting this direction. And then now we have uh, this little force couple which is also creating a twist. So it creates this uh, additional destabilization. Um, so we need to account for that uh, when we do um, our, our checking our member moment capacity and the steel code uh, gives us that. And that's a bit of what we'll talk about today. Um, and then sort of the last point that we had gotten up to was talking about restraints. So what's happening at the... Um, the ends of, uh, of a segment. And one of the, um, 
one of the big challenges uh, is when you know, you first start learning about how to uh, design steel sections and, and check the member moment capacity of them is really one of terminology. So we have this terminology of um, restraints and supports and segments and member. Um, and so uh, we drew a few little pictures here to just kind of um, hopefully uh, clarify this a little bit. So um, if we've got uh, supports, so supports uh, resist uh, deformations and rotations in the plane of the applied load. So um, think about if we have this simply supported structure here, uh, the supports are keeping the beam from going uh, vertically uh, and, and uh, translationally uh, in the plane of the, um, of the load. Um, if the, um, and this is the, and think about supports are kind of what you've been trained with um, through your mechanics class, through your statics class. So supports are what you're comfortable with. Uh, and the, so think supports in plane load, think about them as they're, they're keeping the, um, they're supporting the weight of the beam. A restraint is something which stops either um, out of plane movement um, or twist. So out of plane uh, deformation or twist. So uh, we've got this drawing uh, in, you know, looking in plan for this um, uh, simply supported beam. And so we've got these goal posts up here. So if we put these goal posts on either side, these goal posts are keeping the beam from uh, moving laterally. And um, if we look sort of you know, at the plan here, they keep it from twisting over. So uh, again, uh, restraints are uh, what we uh, use to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, re restrict lateral movement or twist um, of an element. Uh, when we are calculating the member moment capacity, uh, we calculate it in between points of lateral restraint. Uh, not necessarily in between supports, and we'll draw one, a couple pictures to help um, uh, clarify that some more. So I've drawn these sort of arbitrary, uh, idealized restraints and supports, but what do they look like um, in real life? So say we have a, um, say we have an I section here, and there's some, um, you know, it's sitting on a ledge. And um, say we've only bolted down the, um, the bottom flange there. And you've got a load uh, which is being applied in this direction. Well, the support is, um, you know, it, it is this bench here, or this, this ledge that it's sitting on. Um, and it's the, uh, the bolts are keeping it from moving uh, in plane and the uh, ledge here is keeping it from moving in plane up and down. Um, the restraint part is the bolts are keeping it moving uh, laterally out of plane. However, they don't uh, restrict the twist. So a restraint can do, you know, one, they can do one or the other or both. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, here's what we'll call a partial twist. And we'll talk about this in, in greater detail when we start going through um, these elements a bit more. Um, however, so say we wanted to to stop that twist and give it a um, you know full restraint. Well, what we would do is we would put in these um, uh, little um, stiffeners, so these sort of thin plates here, uh, to weld them in here on the edge. And so now, if this top flange wants to uh, kick out in lateral torsional buckling, well. It has to. It's supported by, so it can't move sideways uh, because we're, we've got it nailed down there, and it can't twist. So that's what we call a full um, restraint. So that's that's where we went got up to in our previous lecture, um, and so I think we will continue on talking about uh, sort of restraints um, and, and a little bit more on our terminology. And then we'll get really into sort of the, the heart of how NZS 344, the steel standard, um, uh, looks at these equations and, and how we, we use them and, and how we account for all of these 
uh, restraints and load heights and uh, etc. Uh, with code provisions. But like I said, the, the code provisions are important, um, but what's more important is understanding why they're there and what the mechanisms they are that they're trying to um, uh, restrain uh, or, or um, you know, account for. So we'll go back to just a, uh, a quick A quick recap of terminology. So with, uh, you know, we're lateral torsional buckling, and we'll just um, abbreviate that as LTB. Um, remember that this is the... Um, it's for a member bending capacity, and it is, um, well, shall we say, uh, out of plane buckling, or uh, yeah, say, yeah, buckling out of plane to direction of the applied load. Um, it only occurs about the strong axis, well, occurs, we'll say, for for bending about the strong axis, and um, what we... Uh, all all restraints um, are with respect to the critical flange. So a lot of what we've written down here is just uh, is just review uh, to get it sort of in the in the front of your mind while while you're watching this video. Uh, but this sort of terminology critical flange is, um, is is something we haven't talked about before. So what is it? So you know just by pure definition um, the Critical flange equals, uh, it's the flange that deflects the most during lateral torsional buckling. All right, that's pretty pretty straightforward. So if we have a um, if we have a simply supported beam I'll just put it on, on rollers for both sides. 
and um, we have a, a load applied about the strong axis. Um, well, if this element is going to undergo lateral torsional buckling, so say you know that the bottom stays here, um, we're going to have you know this element um, is going to kick out. So the flange will sort of kick out uh, something like. this where let me just draw it in red for you and maybe make it a little bit more clear so you know it's we'll have some twist and some buckling of the of the section so uh, not my best drawing but uh, sort of an odd geometry but you sort of get the point where, you know, um, if this is undergoing lateral torsional buckling, the bottom flange isn't moving because the, the bottom flange is in tension. It's stable. But the top flange, well, it's the one that's going to deflect uh, the most during lateral torsional buckling. So this is um, the critical flange is... Typically, the flange in compression. All right, well, that makes sense. So for, um, we'll just do a series of, of drawings here. So um, again, simply supported uh, I section so if we have a load here well you know and we'll just uh, we'll, we'll abbreviate critical flange as um, C dot F so our critical flange is the the top one here all right if we have a um, so that that's with a simply supported so if we have say um, like a, a propped cantilever so that's our eye section and you know, let's just let's draw the the moment diagram for for this one, obviously. Moment looks like that. Sorry, let me uh, our bending moment diagram here, and we'll just draw where compression. Uh, on the top is positive. So if we have, um, you know, say a, a bending moment diagram like this, and we put some load on the top, uh, well, it's going to have a moment diagram just plotting on the tension side, uh, a moment diagram that looks like this positive, negative. So, you know, what's the critical flange here? Well, at some point, you know, say that, you know, if we redraw that moment diagram down here, um, well, in this region, Uh, the critical flange is on the top because the top is in compression, right? You got the the happy beam, uh, but in this region here, 
you got sort of the sad beam. Critical flange is on the bottom. So that's how we, we sort of define our critical flange. Um, and it's really based on what our, um, uh, our boundary conditions are and which flange is in uh, compression. So the only time that we have a, um, that we deviate from it being the compression flange um, is if we have a cantilever. So here, you know, I had a propped cantilever. So um, critical flange can also be the tension flange for a cantilever. And that's because um, if you have a, a, a cantilevered section here, uh, it really just comes down to the way that it, uh, it twists. And so, I mean, if this is all kind of confusing, uh, don't worry too much. We will do, um, you know, some examples. But so, you know, if you have a, a section like this, um, well, that cantilever is going to really want. So if we look at it um, in sort of a, a, a section view here, or looking from the end, so say we look at section A, A. Well, if you had A, A, that's our undeformed, and this is again right at the end. Well, if you've got a um, a big load on like that, well, you might get this really large. Um, sort of movement where this whole whole cantilever is really kicking out and you can at times get that bottom portion uh, actually deflecting further um, but um, other than for this you know one weird case with cantilevers where we we want to check um, and this really comes down to checking restraints and, and what what elements are restrained um, and then uh, what we want to do is uh, check both in a cantilever and also you want to check you know what your restraint conditions are for both if you have a um, um, you know if you've got reversing moment all right so that's that's our talk about critical flanges um, also you know continuing our uh, terminology here uh, what we care about is um, you know lateral torsional buckling Members versus segments. So, uh, just like we talked about the difference between supports and restraints, uh, members uh, and segments are, are also another terminology which can sort of uh, confuses people. So, um, if we start with a member, Uh, just by definition, members span between supports or, you know, cantilever out, lever from one support to a free end. All right, that's not that big a deal. So members are, are what we're what we're used to seeing. So you know this here is a member. So we've got two supports. 
and, and the member is just the, uh, the element which spans between those supports. Um, a segment is the portion of the member that's between restraints. So now this is where, where it gets a little bit, you know, new and sort of confusing. So if we talked about, um, you know, if, if we bring up our, our previous picture, well, we've got, uh, say, a member here, and we've got some supports, but we also have some restraints. Well, you know, we did, I said here that the segment is the portion of a member which is between restraints. Well, that, that portion could be 100% um, is between restraints. And, you know, that happens commonly where, you know, you've got uh, supports which are stopping your in-plane uh, deformations and rotations and your restraints which are stopping your out-of-plane. So either your um, just lateral defor deformation or lateral deformation and twist. And so, um, but what we can also have is we can have segments which come um, at the, uh, the middle of a element. So if we um, say we draw a primary beam here. And it has some secondary beams which frame into it. So that's our secondary beams and say that they're they're attached with some you know with a, a web cleat in there. And um, you know, say that these uh, the primary beam uh, for you know lack of a, a better connection, uh, so say we've got some, Stiffeners on the ends, uh, keeping it from uh, rotating uh, at the ends, and we have, uh, you know, we've, we've anchored it into the concrete here. So say it's sitting in like that. And this is sort of going off into, you know, space out the other way. So uh, that, that's sort of our three-dimensional drawing. What we want to do is determined for this primary beam um, what our uh, you know restraints are for it so and and sort of what the um, challenges are or so what the differences are of our segments versus our members and so say we have you know some load well, I'll say we just have some load coming down on these secondary beams and um, we'll take off these loads here and so that loads coming on the secondary beams so let's just draw this as a free body diagram so we'll say that this uh, primary beam that it's simply supported and 
And um, so it's got simply supported. These are, so our member is the primary beam of distance L. So that's at distance L. Now the restraint. So restraint is just something which stops either lateral deformation or twist. So we already talked about um, in our previous uh, drawing, you know, that you you can, you know, these are two different ways that we can, you know, restrain something at the ends. So that's what I've drawn here. I've drawn that we have a, uh, you know, both some uh, bolts uh, holding this, um, this flange and it's keeping it from moving sideways and it's keeping it from twisting. And so what we do when we draw a restraint is we put an X. And we'll say we have that at both ends. Um, and we'll just say that's a full restraint and a full restraint. We'll talk about full restraints here in a moment. Where else might we have a restraint on this member? Well, it's actually where the secondary beam is framing in because what's a, what's a restraint do? Well, it stops it moving, uh, stops the critical flange from moving laterally. So does this, um, can this flange move laterally here? Well, not really. I mean, if uh, this is similar to, you know, if you've got a buckling problem, uh, putting a, a member at the mid height um, of whatever buckling uh, member you are to cut down the span. So uh, we definitely have a restraint in the middle. And, um, you know, depending upon the depth of the beam, um, if it's similar to that depth, well, that'll keep it from twisting as well. So we'll probably also have another full restraint there. So now the question is, how many segments do we have? Well, if a segment is a portion of a member between restraints, we have two segments. We get segment one and segment two. So when we do our design, we don't design over the whole member. We design segment by segment. So when we're looking at um, our alpha M, when we're looking at our restraints and our effective length, so when we bring in uh, you know, our critical buckling our equation, this LE is going to be the segment length instead of the member length. So that's, um, that's one of the key things to sort of uh, you know, uh, internalize when you are doing these uh, member um, bending capacities is everything's based upon segments, not based upon uh, the entire length. And it's whatever is that uh, lowest critical buckling that's uh, uh, going to be the um, uh, governing portion. So, With that, um, I think we will start looking at um, the equations that we have for um, our member capacity. So um, the uh, a buckling equation, so the um, member moment capacity in NZS uh, 3404, is um, as follows. So you've got um, the uh, member moment capacity equals alpha m times alpha s times the section uh, moment capacity um, uh, time uh, about the x direction. So um, we've already seen this, this is, you know, just determining the section capacity, and this is based upon whether the section is compact or non-compact or slender. Uh, we've seen alpha M. This is just based upon uh, what our um, uh, distribution of moment demand is on the section. So whether it's a uniform uh, moment diagram or if it's slanted or the like. Um, the thing that we still haven't seen is this alpha s. So um, uh, alpha s is called the it's 
slenderness. Reduction value. And um, the alpha S term is really where we bring in all of these things around um, the critical buckling moment, about the, um, uh, you know, our restraint sections around our segment length. All of that comes in with this alpha S term. Um, and alpha S is really, you know, you can kind of read this whole member moment um, equation as uh, based on the relative magnitudes of the section capacity Uh, you know, section capacity, ms of x, and the elastic buckling moment, m, o, a. Remember, that elastic buckling moment uh, was that great big uh, equation which had in uh, the twist and the buckling and you know all of that. So you know how they um, how they get this uh, and how they've sort of derived. And so before I get into that, take a step back. This is you know uh, seems analogous to um, the um, you know when we're looking at non-compact sections, where uh, with a non-compact section. Um, you know, this is obviously section capacity and looking at local buckling. Or the non-compact section, we knew that we would get some yield, but we'd buckle before we fully yielded the section. This alpha S term is the analogous term for when we're looking at um, the member capacity of a section where uh, we, we will get somewhere, you know, our maximum is M sub X. Uh, so I should probably, you know, just put this small caveat here, which is um, smaller than, less than or equal to m of x. Uh, that makes sense. You know, we can't get, you know, this is this is our limit here. You know, it's a full plastic section. What this alpha s means is that uh, there'll be some buckling, you know, there may be some buckling before that, and that's what we have to check. And, um, you know, if you're to plot this up, and this is this is how they've come up with this term, so part of it is this MOA, which is, you know, um, uh, this, this highly detailed um, equation for the, um, you know, elastic buckling and the you know, lateral torsional buckling from mechanics. And the other part is from, you know, test data. So say that we had um, a, a bunch of test data. Um, you know, it's got some... Uh, you know, you'd say these dots are all experimental values. Uh, and if we plot those up with, you know, the slenderness of the section, the member, sorry, I was call that, you know, L over R1. So just like buckling. And then on the um, uh, Y axis, we would have you know, our member capacity divided by M sub P. Well, and there'll be, you know, there's a limiting factor of, you know, 1.0. So this, read this as percent of the plastic moment. And, you know, if this is sort of 0 0.5. What we find is that we get, uh, you know, we get this sort of envelope like this. And um, is this bottom line 
is really comes from the NZS 3404 equation. So, uh, and um, for alpha s. Now, this alpha s is really just our way to, what we want is we need a relationship which we know is going to be conservative. Uh, we know it's not going to create beams which are, um, uh, you know, going to um, be, um, you know, failing. And so this dotted line here, say this is our elastic buckling moment. M's of A, and this line is a uh, fully plastic section. So, what we want is we want to make sure, so this is our test data, this is real life. This elastic buckling moment is, is coming from mechanics, as you can see. Uh, it's a little bit conservative. Um, oh, sorry, it's a, it's a little bit, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, not, not necessarily representing. What we want is we want to have some, you know, factor which we know is going to be, if we design to that, uh, all of our experimental data will have greater capacity uh, for a given slenderness ratio. And that's what this equation for, for alpha S is. Alpha S ends up equaling 0.6 times the square root of m sub s over m o a whole thing plus three all of that's under the radical minus m sub s over m o a so it's this great big equation and the reason that it's a uh, kind of, I'd say, sort of arbitrary, ugly equation is really because it, it's imperial. It, uh, it's um, empirical. It, it's just trying to fit some, some existing data. Um, and all it's doing is it's, mo it's looking at what's the ratio between the buckling moment and the, um, uh, the section capacity. And so um, that's how we... Uh, uh, we, we get to that. So, um, uh, just a reminder, so this is our MOA. MOA equals pi squared times E times IY over LE squared plus G times J plus pi squared E I sub W over LE squared. Take all of that and take the square root. So if we look at this equation, and this is our um, our, our, you know, member moment capacity. Um, our alpha M, uh, uh, we, we look up in a table, so we, we already know that. Uh, M's of X, um, we either we can look it up in the section tables or we can work it out from first principles, and that's based upon uh, whether the section will reach its full plastic uh, section capacity before buckling or not. Um, the uh, alpha s, all right, so we've got an equation for alpha s. Alpha s is just m of s, so um, yeah, we've got that. We'll just put x down here just for uh, consistency. Um, MOA, we have MOA, so uh, pi is a constant, e, i, so all of these are section constants. The only thing we don't have is this le. And so how do we determine le? Well, uh, le... equals this factor kt times kl times kr 
times L. All right, so we're we're getting there. So L equals the segment length. You know, that makes sense. Uh, we're looking at this uh, member moment capacity segment by segment. Um, case of T is the twist restraint factor, and that's always going to be less than or equal to 1.0. KL is the load height factor. Um, and that's also going to be you know, greater than or equal to 1.0. And then KR is the uh, rotation restraint factor, uh, which will be less than or equal to 1.0, and it's typically equal to 1.0. All right, so these are all just some factors which modify our effective length. So um, if our effective length goes up, uh, we will have a lower um, critical buckling moment, which means we have less capacity um, it will, it will, uh, we'll see this uh, lateral torsion buckling happen sooner. So we have that for both this twist restraint factor and this load height factor. Uh, this rotation restraint factor is the only thing which kind of helps us out. And it's um, uh, sort of going to be, uh, but it's typically one and it's typically ignored. All right, so let's start, let's walk through some of these and see, well, you know, what do they do and, and how do we use them uh, when we apply them in this uh, equation. So uh, we will start with the uh, twist restraint factor. That is K sub T. Um, and it's really, this is based on the effectiveness of the end restraints And so, I mean, if we're looking at the um, these sort of goalposts, um, uh, you know, you know, the the tendency to keep the element from from wanting to rock over. It's like, well, how well do they do? And the, these are all um, in these uh, tabulated um, portions of the code, and, and these are also in your notes. So you can see we've got this twist restraint factor. And it's based upon, you'll see that we've got this FF, this FL, LL, FU, FP, PP. What are all of these things? So um, the reason we have these two letters is we're looking at the restraints at the two ends of the segment. So you can either have a full restraint at one end and a full at the other. You can have a full and a lateral, a full and a partial, a full and an unrestrained, or two partial. And then you have some factor uh, and some equation um, for, for each of those. So the question is, well, what do these different restraints look like? So if we have a, a full restraint, um, uh, well, that means we're going to have, you know, no twist uh, and no um, uh, uh, lateral movement. So see with you know full restraint uh, 
No. Lateral. Movement. No twist. So this is our F A partial restraint P no lateral movement some twist restraint L for a uh, lateral restraint. So we have no lateral movement can twist. And a U is unrestrained. Can move. Sideways. Hand. Twist. And the other important thing to keep in mind that all of these restraints and all of these movements that we're, we're restraining are all for the critical flange. And, um, you know, what you'll see, uh, and so, you know, the question is, you know, for, for, you know how, do you, how do you know what these look like? Well, I've put up on Canvas, and, and you'll see in your notes, um, there have been some reports putting out for some typical um, you know, connection details. Um, so here's one which is a, a you know, fairly uh, classic one. So say that we've got um, so number 10. So the connection between the secondary beam and the primary beam is this little piece of equal angle. So you've got a you know angle, say it's welded onto one leg is welded onto the primary beam, and the secondary beam is bolted on. So how do we you know how do we have this re how do we classify this restraint um, for the primary beam? Well, it depends upon the depth of the section, and so what uh, this Hera detail says, and this is all from you know testing and experience um, from lots of buildings getting built is that um, if the secondary beam is greater than um, or equal to half the depth of the primary beam, uh, we count it as a full restraint. Um, if it's not, uh, then it's a partial restraint. And um, I won't go through these in detail, but there's a number of them here um, which sort of uh, help uh, clarify what's a, a full and what's a partial restraint. Um, also within uh, your course notes, uh, there's uh, a number of different um, um, sort of locations for full and partial. And so um, uh, the, the, again, the, the big thing to keep in mind is, you know, what's allowed to, to happen to that critical flange. So which is often going to be just the flange, which is in compression, uh, with the exception of a cantilever in which we check both of them. All right, so that's our twist restraint. Um, now we want to see our load height factor. Case of L. So this is just what we talked about, whether we're applying um, at, uh, at um, or above the shear center. So it just takes into count that 
the load can be applied. above the shear center. Cool, kind of just sort of simple as that. Um, and again, this is just coming straight out of a, um, uh, it's a table in the book and it's, you know, and it just depends upon whether we're applying the load uh, within the segment. So within the segment is say, uh, you have a, a simply supported uh, beam here, and it's got restraints at the end, and you have a load there. Or if you're applying, um, say, uh, you know, we have a, a, a different element, but it has a, a restraint right at the middle. And then if its uh, load height is at the shear center or below, um, then, you know, Excellent. Uh, we can you know, take it as one for both cases. Um, if it's applied upon the top flange, well, we have to increase our effective length by 1.4. So a pretty significant increase. Um, and again, this is all based upon what our restraint conditions are uh, from, from up above. Um, well, something I want to point out. So when we have a segment which has restraints, so the FU or PU, well, these are cantilevers, you know. And so if you apply um, above the shear center, so say you apply, so you've got a cantilever. Say that, you know, um, you have a, a cantilever and you apply the load um, at the top flange. Well, you've got a restraint here. This is your restraint of F. Uh, this restraint here is unrestrained, so it's U. At top flange, this means that we have um, a KL factor equal to 2.0. And this KL factor, well, if that's 2.0, means our effective length doubles, means that the moment at which our buckling occurs is much lower, so it really, really reduces down our capacity. So um, while... Yes, there are, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, sort of terminology and sort of code equations here. They all kind of make a lot of sense and they're, they're really show, uh, so understanding, you know, why they are, why they're so big and the, the physical phenomenon behind that is really helpful in um, sort of, you know, rearranging how you would do your, um, uh, your, your detailing and your loading so that, you know, maybe we would have a connection where we'd come in at the bottom flange. Uh, so we're below the shear center, and so we can use a factor of 1.0, and that means that we can keep a smaller section here. All right, so we have just um, uh, one more factor to look at, uh, and then we'll wrap up this uh, video, um, and then we'll do an, uh, an example to kind of bring all of this together. And that is our... rotation restraint factor. So this one's an odd one and it's um, I think the the thing that so it's often equal to 1.0. So this is the only one that we've talked about uh, so far, uh, which is going to be less than or equal to one. So this is the only thing that helps us with our um, else of E. And really what it is, is if you say, we look in plan view, um, at a, uh, uh, at a, a steel member that has a number of segments. So say, you know, we have um, say we've just started to buckle 
over this middle segment. And this is a um, this is a steel beam. We have a restraint, a restraint, and restraints at the ends. And our L sub E is here at the end. So in order for KR to be less than one, it's, it's um, these little end sections need to be very very stiff of plane um, with full lateral restraint. Essentially what this factor is doing is saying that, well, you know, say you have a continuous member or you have a, a steel beam which is buried in concrete at both ends. Because lateral torsional buckling is, um, you know, a part of it is about the, the outer plane buckling. Well, you've, if you really restrict uh, the top flange movement in plan, uh, well, then the code will give you a, um, a factor. This is really, really hard to pull off in practice. Um, you know, very difficult to accomplish. KR less than 1.0 in practice. And that's why we tend to just assume that it's going to equal 1.0. Um, I mean, we can have a look at what, uh, again, the table that it comes out with um, and the end restraint and the end restraint of, about the major axes. Um, yeah, I, uh, it's kind of a complicated factor. And like I said, for most steel construction, conventional steel construction, it's going to equal 1.0. So we won't spend too much time on it. Um, and so, you know, it's a safe assumption just to take it as one. Um, the only time where you might get it is if you have these really side spans. So if you have a continuous beam and the side spans are really, really stiff out of plane from for bending this way. But that, that's about the only time you'll get that. So uh, wrapping up, um, we'll just come back. So our member moment capacity. Uh, so this has been kind of a, a big journey to get us here, uh, looking at so derivations, lots of factors, lots of um, you know uh, behavior of of beams um, uh, to to out of plane buckling. But just a quick recap, you know, our member moment capacity is just a section capacity times a couple of factors. Um, the maximum it can be is that full section capacity. And this is what we get um, if we have a full lateral restraint. So say we've got a concrete deck which is supporting uh, the compression flange, um, you know, every uh, along its whole length. Well, uh, LE essentially equals zero, MOA equals zero. Uh, this is, uh, you know, then an undefined uh, term. So if you've got zero, well, then that's going to be um, the section capacity. But anyways, if it doesn't, so then we're going to look uh, in between segments. Remember, segments are points between lateral restraint. Um, and then for each of those segments, we'll look at what our bending moment pattern looks like over that. And that's how we'll get our alpha M. And then we'll look at our section uh, geometry and the effective length of that segment uh, and account for what will basically change the length of the segment based upon these factors, which account for where we're applying the load and what the uh, end conditions look like. And then from there, we'll get our member moment capacity. So that's what we will do in the next video is we'll run through all of this um, sort of from, you know, uh, starting off getting the section capacity and then ending up with the member moment capacity. Um, and then that will be uh, what we'll do for probably the next two videos. All right, so thank you very much. And that's where we'll end it.